All right, so this is uh, the second of my uh, chapters for my online 2401 uh, lecture series. This is chapter 10, which is muscle tissue. Uh, it's going to be probably taken in two clips, so here's the beginning. Um, what I've written up here is a bunch of stuff, and we'll start off with the kind of large characteristics of muscle, and then we'll move down to the microscopic stuff. Um, there are basically three different types of muscle tissue, there, which you guys have learned in lab already. This is skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle. And the basic characteristics you have to know, you've got these already given to you, so I'm just going to repeat them here. And that is skeletal muscle is voluntary, means you can control it consciously. It is uh, multinucleate, so there's many, many nuclei in each muscle cell. It is striated, so you're going to see these stripes, and we'll talk about those later. Uh, and it is uh, used for movement, your body movement. That's what they call it, skeletal muscle. So I move my skeleton with it. Cardiac muscle, the name it tells you what it's for. It's in your, it is your heart muscle. It's the majority of your heart is cardiac muscle. These cells are slightly different looking. They do have the striations. Um, they're kind of branched a little bit. And then you'll see that they have one or maybe two nuclei. So you can have two nuclei in some of them because of the way they branch. Smooth muscle, the last little group, is kind of a weird little muscle. Here's one smooth muscle cell right here, like that. It has one nucleus. It's what, what they call fusiform or spindle shape. So that shape right there is indicative of that. And these guys can kind of smooth, you know, kind of group in with each other like this. They kind of lay in little sheets like this where you can see them kind of, you know, combining in this big sheet. And these guys form uh, the muscle around your tubes. So things like your cardiovascular system, your digestive system, these are all surrounded or lined at least with smooth muscle. So check your lab material for that. And anyway, uh, now here's some basic muscle characteristics. Uh, muscle is excitable, and we'll talk about how you excite a muscle later. It's not by taking it to for ice cream. It's by uh, stimulating it with the neurotransmitter, uh, so it can be stimulated. Uh, it is contractile, and that's the the whole raison d'être, which is uh, my country French. Of uh, it's contractile, so it gets shorter. So that's the whole purpose of muscle cells is to get shorter, no matter what they are. It is also extensible. Now that means it gets longer, but it's not forcible extension. Muscle never will never push. Muscle will only pull. And so um, you may say, well, I, I'm pushing like this, right? That's a push. Well, that's just these muscles on the back side of my arm getting shorter. So when I contract the biceps muscles, it pulls on the radius. When I contract the triceps muscle, it pulls on the ulna. So they're still pulling no matter what. Now the extensible part that I talked about there is that you can stretch them back out again. So they are able to return to their normal length. The last bit here that they're elastic, it's kind of like a rubber band. If you stretch them too far, they'll bounce back to their normal resting length is what they call that. So four basic characteristics. Now I'm gonna move to a, a, a image up here on the screen to kind of describe the basic uh, sort of gross anatomy of a muscle itself. So these the term muscle and muscle fiber, you'll see are two different terms. So here's a bone up there, okay, this is your femur, it looks like. And there's a tendon that attaches the muscle itself to the bone. This whole thing right here is gonna be one skeletal muscle. So this would be your, oh, I don't know, what is that one? Something, a quadriceps muscle or a, uh, some, you know, thigh muscle. So this whole thing is a skeletal muscle right here. And it is surrounded by a sheet of connective tissue called the epimysium. So the epimysium surrounds muscles, the whole muscle, and it's made of dense irregular connective tissue. When you look at the muscle right here, you can break it into these little groups, these little chunks. And there's one labeled right here, and this is what that is. This thing is pulled out, kind of pulled out of that muscle, and this is called a fascicle, F-A-S-C-I-C-L-E. A fascicle, and if you if you ever pictured cutting uh, a steak against the grain, you'll see this kind of pattern in that in that meat, right? And that's because you're looking at the ends of all of these fascicles and all of the muscle fibers that are within them. So here's one big fascicle, and it is also surrounded by a connective tissue membrane. This connective tissue membrane is called the perimysium. So epimysium around the muscle, perimysium around the fascicle. It is also dense irregular connective tissue. 
And then lastly, we're going to pull out an individual muscle fiber. So a fasci uh, muscle is a bundle of fascicles, a fascicle is a bundle of fibers, and when you see the word fiber, think cell. So a muscle cell equals a muscle fiber. They're the same exact thing. So fibers equal cells in this case. So here's one muscle fiber. It also has connective tissue around it and in between it. That connective tissue that surrounds the muscle fibers is called the endomycium. It says between individual fibers, between and around. So the endomycium is the connective tissue around the fibers, and it is made of areolar connective tissue. So it's a lot that a lot like more of a gentle than that denser, dense irregular connective tissue. I'll show you the next bit here, and then I'm going to go to back to the board. And this is the same concept here. Here's a whole muscle. Here's a fascicle. Here's a fiber. And so we're gonna the next time I go up here, we're gonna look at this, which is in the individual muscle fiber. If I go back here, here you see it there in the bottom right. That's a fiber, and you can see this, the little blue oval things, those are nuclei. And here you see nucleus there, nucleus there, nucleus there. So if you see a sheet of a membrane or something with uh, these little oval shapes underneath it, you know you're looking at a muscle fiber or at the level of a muscle cell. So let's go back over here to the board. And uh, as well keep my stick. Um, Here's those terms again for you to, to write down. The epimyceum surrounds the muscle, perimyceum surrounds fascicles, endomyceum surrounds the fibers. Here's a couple of terms that you should be familiar with. The origin and insertion of a muscle. Uh, the origin is where it begins, the insertion where, is it, where it ends, but what does that really mean? Well, let's take for instance my biceps again. So my biceps has an origin up here on my clavicle and my uh, scapula. It's weird to think that it's up here on my shoulder, but that's where the origin is. And, when, and its insertion is down here on my radius. So it originates here, it inserts here. Well, how do I know which one's which? Well, when I contract the muscle, the one with the insertion is the one that moves. So the moving one is the one that has the insertion attached to it. So stable moves. Tendons are the things that connect the, the dense, regular connective tissue that connects the muscle to the bone. So tendons connect muscle to bone. As we learned in the last chapter, ligaments connect bone to bone. Uh, some fun facts here about muscles. This is about the, the level of muscle, the whole muscle, skeletal muscle itself. Muscles have one nerve and one artery that supply them. So there's going to be one big bundle of neurons that goes into the muscle and one large uh, oxygenated vessel that goes into it as well. Those nerves branch out, those arteries branch out into capillary beds, and then returning back from the muscle, you're going to find several to many veins. So you're going to have lots of ways out of the muscle for the blood. And you're also going to have sensory nerves coming back from the muscle too, but we're not going to talk about those in this chapter. All right, moving over here to some uh, more terms, which hopefully will make sense uh, shortly. The term motor unit. So a motor unit, and let's see if I can fit in a drawing here. A motor unit consists of one motor neuron and all of the associated fibers. So if this is a motor neuron right here. And it's going to have a lot of little branches at the end of it. So lots and lots and lots of these branches. And each of these little branches, if this is a motor neuron, each of these little branches is going to go to its own muscle fiber. So I'm not going to draw them all in here, but each of these little things represents a muscle fiber uh, that this motor neuron is uh, supplying or stimulating. So what this means is that I can have anywhere from a really small number of motor units, uh, sorry, a really small number of muscle fibers associated with one motor neuron. So maybe like four fibers, all the way up to like hundreds of fibers. Now let me give you a little demonstration on as to why that, why that exists. Why do you have these motor units of different sizes? And if you want to picture my facial expressions, can you get, do you get a good shot of me here? So if you want to picture, I'm going to stand back under lights so you can see me. I don't want to look like this. Uh, I can make very delicate changes to my facial expression by simply altering the contraction of a couple of muscles. So I've got really small motor units that supply my face, and I've got a lot of small ones that supply my fingers as well. But let's show you the difference between a couple of contracted facial muscles. So if I'm, I'm going to do a fake yearbook smile. 
cheeseburger, sorry, or it's cheese, what do they say? Right? And then I'm gonna change that just by slightly contracting some more fibers. Ready? So yearbook smile. See the change there? A little different, right? So that's really important because humans being real social animals, we have to understand each other's facial expressions. Like if I'm like, that's like dubious, right? If I'm if I'm like that's happy or excited about something, if I'm right, real you know minor changes in my these facial muscle contractions convey very different meanings. So you want really precise control over facial expressions, fingertip move, movement, uh, movements, right? So if I'm picking at something or drawing something really small or coloring in between the lines, I want to have control over that. Now, the muscle, the muscles of my, you know, trunk and my arms and my legs don't require that much precise movement. So if I'm going to do a, uh, if I'm going to do bench press, right? This, this, if I was on my back, this movement right here doesn't require a lot of subtlety, right? It's just engage a lot of muscles, push the big weight. Or if I'm gonna do a squat, taking me off camera, right? Then I come back, right? That's just moving big muscles of my butt and of my legs. Big motor units can supply those, right? That's why, that's why we have different size motor units. All right, moving on, uh, the term neuromuscular junction. And that's my abbreviation for junction, it's pretty common. The neuromuscular junction consists of basically three parts. An axon terminal, which is labeled here number one, little bulb, bulb at the end of these guys. So if I was going to draw axon terminals on these guys, they'd look like that. So the axon terminal is the end of an axon, and there's an impulse coming down here. A synapse, or synaptic cleft, is the space between. And then this is a muscle fiber right here. So this is a muscle cell. And this little depression right there is what's called a motor end plate. This whole thing together uh, comprises a neuromuscular junction. Neuro, the nervous system, muscular, the muscular system and the junction, that's where they meet. Here we see another little diagram, a little drawing I made that shows what's happening at this neuromuscular junction. And that is the, this axon terminal is gonna form vesicles. It's gonna form those little capsules uh, containing, as we'll see, something called a neurotransmitter. And those little vesicles will release that neurotransmitter into the synapse. It'll travel across the synapse, and it'll do something here, which we'll talk about uh, shortly. Now, let's go back up to the, uh, to the uh, screen up here. <clears throat> and I'm gonna go, I'm gonna break down this, this image right here for you. So we're back to the level of a muscle fiber, right? Now, this right here, I told you that around the muscle fiber was something called the endomycium. And, you know, that's this layer right here. But here you see something called the sarcolemma. Well, this is, muscles have their own kind of language. And I always talked about it like Smurfs have their own language. So Smurfs, you know how like, if you've ever, if you guys don't know what the Smurfs are, look them up. But the Smurfs are always like, let's go Smurf that. I don't even know. It's real generic, right? They say like, we had, you know, we had a good time smurfing the other day. I don't know what they were talking about, but they had fun. So muscles are similar. They have this sarco language, right? So if you see sarco, here's the sarcolemma. That's the plasma membrane of the muscle cell. Sarcoplasm. That's the cytoplasm of the muscle cell. Uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum. Well, that one, they're not even trying to hide it, right? That's the, that's the endoplasmic reticulum of the muscle cell. They just, Let's, how should we check it up? Well, let's put sarco in front of it. Ah, all right, now it's new. It's the same thing. It's the endoplasmic reticulum, the cytoplasm in between these guys, and the sarcolemma, which is the plasma membrane. So if you see sarcolemma, that equals plasma membrane. This is one muscle cell. Now, you know how we had them nested over here, right? We had muscle, fascicle, muscle fiber. Now we've got even another doll nesting inside of these dolls. We've got these guys, which are called myofibrils. So a myofibril is another tube inside of the muscle cell. And these guys right here are what we're gonna be going to the level of next. Before we do that, I want you to look at a couple of structures within this muscle cell, one of which is this sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now, if you remember from just basic cells, sarcoplasmic reticulum is this big membranous, amorphous thing that extends all the way throughout the cell. Same thing here. 
and they do a lot of protein synthesis and they do a lot of lipid synthesis and they do a lot of other stuff. We're gonna focus on one job of the sarcoplasmic reticulum here today and that is that it's gonna be a calcium storage uh, organelle. So for, these, for our purposes in the muscular system, it stores calcium. These green things right here, these green tubes, are called transverse or T tubules. So a transverse tubule, it transverse just means across. Remember, transverse section is you know, perpendicular to the longitudinal axis. So a transverse tubule goes in a transverse direction across these muscle fibers. Associated with these transverse tubules or T tubules, I'll just call them T tubules from now on, are parts of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So you see that right here we've got a purple tube, a green tube, and a purple tube. Now don't memorize them as being purple, green, and purple. They're not that color. But just for this drawing purposes, they are. So this purple bit right here, this component of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, is called the terminal cistern. Terminal means end, and cistern means container. So it's an end container of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which does what? Stores calcium. So we've got a lot of calcium stored up in here. We've got these T tubules, which if I trace them back to the outside, well, we're not showing that here, but if I did trace them back to the outside, there would be little openings to these T tubules in this sarcolemma. As a matter of fact, as we'll see in my next drawing soon enough, the T tubules are, if, if, I, if my finger, the path of my fingers represents the uh, sarcolemma, they go down into the muscle cell as these T-tubules. So a T-tubule is just an extension of the sarcolemma that extends into the muscle cell. Let me see the next picture here to see if I want to go there. And I probably do. <clears throat> Let's look at this myofibril down here in the bottom right. Well, you see even more nested stuff down here, right? You see these myofilaments. Am I heading one? Probably not. So you see uh, myofibril, myofilaments. And let's go to the next level here. Here is the muscle cell. Sorry, got to go back. Go back to the big picture here. Uh, we see muscle cell again. Now we're down to the level of myofibril. This is a myofibril, one of these nested filament, one of these nested things within the cell. The myofibrils are where you're going to see these stripes, these striations, and you can see them over here, right? There's dark bands and light bands, dark light, dark light, dark light. Uh, and if we break this down even further, we can break it down into what's called a sarcomere. And a sarcomere goes from basically one of these little blue zigzag lines to another blue zigzag line. And this is stuff you learned in lab, so I'm going to just kind of recover it here. Uh, it's fair game for, for our quiz and test. Uh, the Z-disc is the end of a sarcomere and the other end. In between, and we're going to go down to this guy so I can show you in detail. Within one sarcomere, which is this, within one sarcomere, we see three and some more different protein filaments. We've got these thin filaments, which are actually attached to the Z-disc. These thin filaments are called, are, are made of a protein called actin. So actin is the protein, the filament thickness makes you call them a thin filament, but you can call them actin. <coughs> You can call them actin filaments if you want. That's probably more uh, parsimonious. And you can look that up. Uh, this thick filament here, which kind of floats in between. You can see it kind of floating here in this little space between these thin filaments. This thick filament is made of a protein called myosin. Incidentally, where you see the thick filaments is where you see the dark bands. So myosin bands appear dark under a microscope. Where you don't see the myosin, it looks lighter. So the light bands are where you only see basically the actin and some other proteins. And then the last one for this image is the protein called titin, T-I-T-I-N. So titin is like a little spring and it supports, it's like a spring that holds your, uh, your, uh, your wheels, your uh, axle on. So it's gonna suspend this myosin filament here in this space, so it's kind of just supportive. It's made of tit titan, and uh, that's its job. The main things we're gonna concentrate on are these myosin and these actin filaments, because they're gonna interact in the next lesson
that we've got, and maybe I want to think just for the sake of being on the same camera angle, we'll go here, mm. take it back, no, I'll leave it here. So you can see this big purple guy here, this is the actin, this big blue, these big blue, you know, spheres here are the actin filament, which if I went back to this view, that's these little thin blue lines. So this thin blue line right here is this giant bluish thing right here, just blown up. And I have to introduce you to at least two, maybe three more things here, which I'll deal with on the board. And that is the protein, the filamentous protein called tropomyosin. And what you see here is that tropomyosin is kind of in the way of these little holes here. And that's its job, which I'll re restate later. Tropomyosin's job is to block the binding sites on actin. Well, these little circles right here represent the binding sites on actin that myosin is going to bind to. So myosin is going to grab onto those and kind of walk along, and that's what muscle contraction is. Troponin, its job is, it's this globular protein. Troponin's job is to move tropomyosin. So when it comes time, troponin's gonna say, get out of the way, tropomyosin, because actin now can bind with myosin. And then lastly here is this little ion, calcium, right? Calcium, which we remember, hopefully, is stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, is only released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum when you want to contract a muscle. So here it is already out there in the, in the field, and it's going to be activating troponin, which then moves, tro moves tropomyosin, which then exposes these binding sites, which then allows myosin to bind and the muscle to contract. So let's now go over there again. Oh, he's quick. He's quick, that one. All right, so here we are. Um, this is a muscle fiber. So from here over is where I'm going to be talking about now. This is a muscle fiber, so that makes this little membrane right here that I'm scratching, that's the sarcolemma. That's the plasma membrane of the muscle cell. Here is a neuromuscular junction. We see an axon with an axon terminal the synapse or synaptic cleft, and the motor end plate. Well, I've added a couple of other things. I've added the specific name of the neurotransmitter. This neurotransmitter, ACH, you'll see it abbreviated, is called acetylcholine. And it's your most common, it's everywhere in your body, it's your most common neurotransmitter. And a neurotransmitter, which there are many different types, are things that just send a chemical in, uh, message to a, uh, a target cell. In this case, the target cell is a muscle fiber. So we're looking at the neuromuscular junction of, a, of, of this particular muscle fiber, and we see the acetylcholine being released into the synapse, and what it's gonna do, and I said that it, earlier I said it gets released and does something, well this is what it does. It binds to membrane proteins located in this motor, uh, this motor end plate called chemically gated ion channels. So let's break down that term. An ion channel this should let ions through, right? Like a channel between two lakes lets boats through. Or the Suez Canal or the Panama Canal is a channel that allows things to go from one side to the other. So an ion channel is going to let ions across. Ions are things like sodium and potassium in this case. Uh, chemically gated means that it's going to be opened. It's a gate that only opens with a chemical key. And the chemical key in this case is acetylcholine. So when I want to contract a muscle, again, the generic biceps, when I want to contract a muscle, I send a nervous impulse from my brain down some nerves. One branch of that nerve goes to, my, to fibers in my biceps, and it's going to go and release acetylcholine into this little synapse and stimulate these guys. The end result's going to be this. But the signal has to be received first. So this chemical signal, the acetylcholine, binds to these chemically gated ion channels, and they open up. And this will be something I'll show you here in a minute. But they're going to open up and let sodium in, and then potassium out. So these ions that are located, if, you wanted to, if I wanted to exaggerate, most of the sodium is located outside. You, you, your resting state means that a lot of sodium is located outside of the fiber, 
in the interstitial space, and most of your potassium is located on the inside, right? So you've got a kind of a, a real separation here of the two different ions. Uh, all right, after that first signal is received, you're gonna generate uh, what's called a potential. You're gonna generate an electrical gradient. And now, we're, we don't have to know super details about that, trust me, but you're gonna get a little bit more detail. That electrical gradient that forms as a result of these ions switching sides, first of all, let's just say, when the sodium comes in, that's gonna put a lot of positive uh, ions on the inside. So you're gonna generate a real positive uh, charge inside compared to the outside. So you're gonna, you're gonna have a positive versus a, a less positive or negative charge out here. Well, that differential, that charge differential, causes some more ion channels to open up. Well, these guys have a different name. They're called electrically gated ion channels. So if chemically gated ion channels are opened by a chemical, electrically gated ion channels are opened by this electrical gradient that we formed here in the first place. When this motor end plate gets stimulated right here and the ions switch places, that's gonna cause a wave of, and I could draw in a, you know, a million of these things if I wanted, but it's gonna cause a wave of this electrical charge to move down the sarcolemma, and I'll detail that in the next clip. Move down the sarcolemma. Here's that little T tubule right here. Here's the the this right here. This blob I've drawn on here is the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So you can see that we've got the triad. We've got the terminal cistern of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the T tubule, and a terminal cistern. So this whole thing right here is called a triad. Just the old name they gave it when they first discovered it under a microscope. But in any case, that electrical wave called an action potential, which we'll specify about later, we'll talk about later, travels down the T-tubule, and here we see some more squares. Well, I've drawn some more squares on here because those squares that I've drawn on the membrane of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, those squares are also electrically gated ion channels. And I'm not gonna write it all out. So this electric, this, this action potential as it travels down the T-tubule opens up those ion channels. Well, the ions that we already told you were held inside of the sarcoplasmic reticulum are these calcium ions. So I'm going to open up the gates and let the calcium out. Well, if you, if you remember back to that diagram on the board, calcium's job is to activate troponin. Troponin's job is to move tropomyosin. And when tropomyosin gets moved, that allows us to access the binding sites for myosin. So here we have calcium escaping. Wee, okay, so it gets out of here. And here we have this, this thing right here represents a, a myofibril. And the calcium gets all up in here like that and starts engaging the proteins that are found in these myofibrils, which I've drawn a blown up of up here. So here we see uh, sort of an expanded view of some actin filaments right here, myosin filament right here, Z-disc, right? But, and I've also drawn in the tropomyosin, which is this filamentous guy, and I've labeled it there. It, bo it blocks the binding sites on the actin. And I usually try to draw an example like, or you show an example like this. My hands are the same thickness, so whatever. But my upper hand is gonna represent actin. My lower hand is gonna represent myosin. Well, myosin has little projections on it. These projections are called myosin heads. So they're just these little guys that stick off and they can do this, right? So if tropomyosin's around, they're blocking the binding sites. Myosin doesn't have anywhere to grab. So the muscle can't contract. As soon as that process occurs where calcium gets out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, activates troponin, moves tropomyosin, as soon as tropomyosin gets out of the way, these guys get a foothold. And when they get a foothold on actin, they go and they probably don't make that noise, but that's the noise I like to make them or something, right? So there they go, walking along. 
Now this requires ATP, we're not gonna get into the details of that, but this does require ATP. So, you, and here's some more terminology that, that you do have to know. When the myosin head binds to the actin, it's called a cross bridge. This is a cross bridge that has formed. So cross bridge formation will lead to what's called a power stroke. And that power stroke is when you, you crawl up on that actin. And then other myosin heads at the same time are binding, cr forming cross bridges and conducting power strokes. So if you want to imagine what happens with this unit right here, this is that sarcomere right here. Uh, you often hear it called the, the contractile unit of a muscle cell. What happens when you get this sarcomere uh, um, contracting is that the myosin heads crawl in both directions. So these guys on the right are crawling on these actin filaments. These guys on the left are crawling on these actin filaments. And as they like that, that sarcomere gets shorter. Well, this sarcomere is getting shorter, and that one's getting shorter, and that one's getting shorter. All of the sarcomeres in this whole muscle cell are getting shorter. So as all of those sarcomeres down the whole length of that muscle get shorter, the whole muscle fiber gets shorter. And if I've got many, many muscle fibers in my arm, or in my muscle, and many of them are getting shorter, well, the whole entire muscle gets shorter. So, let me walk through that process one more time right now, just in a, in a sequence without going over the details each time. I'm just gonna describe the sort of steps here. So, a nervous impulse travels down an axon, gets to the axon terminal, where vesicles full of acetylcholine form and are released into the synapse. They make contact on the motor end plate with proteins called chemically gated ion channels, which, when they're activated by the acetylcholine, open up, allowing sodium in first, potassium out second, I'll talk about that in, a, in the next clip. That causes the generation of what's called an action potential, which is a, an electrical gradient. That action potential opens up electrically gated ion channels on the sarcolemma that extend out all around. So as those electrically gated ion channels open and sodium comes in and then potassium goes out, that travels like a wave down the sarcolemma. When it gets to these T-tubules, which, is just an, which are just extensions of the sarcolemma. It travels down the T-tubules, activating more electrically gated ion channels that are found on the sarcoplasmic reticulum's membrane. Sarcopl sarcoplasmic reticulum acts like a prison for calcium. When those gates open up, they all run out, right? And they get involved with these myofibrils, which have sarcomeres, consisting of the Z-disc, the actin filaments, the myosin filaments, the uh, tropomyosin, which is the filamentous one, troponin, which is the globular one. Calcium's job, once it escapes, is to bind to troponin, which, when active, moves tropomyosin. When tropomyosin gets out of the way, myosin can bind to actin, forming, when they do this, forming cross bridges, and then a power stroke, there's a release and a rest stroke, or whatever. And then the whole muscle contracts. So, all of that happens. All you think is you're, you're just gonna go like this. I'm just gonna scratch my head, right? But all that's happening that whole time, every time, no matter what. All right, let's go back over here. I think I have one thing to finish with this clip and then we can pick it up with the next clip. So here we are back at our, uh, our tro tropomyosin and troponin uh, and actin composite, but let me show you this right here. And this is where I'll open on the next clip. Um, this is a graph that you're going to have to understand. and It has a couple of parts, uh, some of which I've named. See, here's the, here's the voltage or electrically gated uh, ion channels. I always call them electrically, but you might see them called voltage gated. When those open up, sodium goes in first. Then you've got potassium channels opening up, and this graph right here I'll describe. It'll, it hopefully will make sense more than this little intro. So we'll just we'll meet this graph in the next section, and that is it for clip one.